Uh, welcome to the webinar on people with caring responsibilities. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Eva Sullivan, film and TV producer with a company called Sabotica. Um, I'll be chairing the, this today and um, I am a mother of two, two boys, child um, at school going age boys, mm -hmm. 10 and 8, um, which is a challenge in itself. Um, and yeah, so this is a particular area of interest uh, to me. So I'm delighted to be chairing this today and, and discussing all the various issues around it. And I think what we might do is go to our panelists and ask everybody to just give them, give a brief intro um, and let us know who they are and, and you know, uh, what they do in the industry. So I'll go to, let me see, can I go to Rebecca first? Sure, I'm happy to be here. It's a um, an area I care a lot about. Um, I'm obviously American. I went to film school in the States, um, worked in LA for a bit, and then came over to London to work in production. Been here for 20 years. I took a seven year gap because I have three children and was concerned I wouldn't be able to get back into the industry. Luckily, there's a charity called Film London that runs a return to work program, which I benefited from and I now help to run it. So uh, we're seeing every year at least 10 carers get back into the industry and the program. So I'm proud to be here on the panel today. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Rebecca. That's great. And uh, Nicola Lyons, please. Hi, Nicola Lyons. I'm the production manager at Northern Ireland Screen. Um, I've been there for about eight years. Um, so I'm the first point of contact for every production. Um, for well just about all across all the genres who want to film in Northern Ireland I, I help with locations crewing up setting up production offices and I'm the point of contact for all productions when they're filming I'm also the point of contact for most crew when they're looking for jobs and when they need advice and help and um, I've been in the industry for um, um, I, I think it says my bio for 25 years it's actually 30 um, so I my first 10 years was in London um, for a big uh, American um, uh, film distributor, uh, United International Pictures, which um, distributed for Paramount, Universal, MGM and DreamWorks. Um, and I actually left London after 10 years in that job to move home because I was um, having my second child. Um, so yeah, another one who with a subject very close to my heart. That's why I left London because I find it having had one child in London and continuing to work in the film and TV industry and the long hours, I decided that life was too short. And when I was having my second child, um, I decided to move home so I could be close to my family. Um, but I was very lucky in that I then uh, was asked to work for the ex-head of marketing at UIP who set up his own consultancy and he allowed me to work from home which in those days we're talking 1998 was when my daughter was born I was able to work from this very office that I'm sitting in now now working from home again um, and uh, with two young children um, I had a full-time nanny because the hours were quite grueling and I did quite a lot of traveling but yeah I had I was in receipt of one of the very first BT home highways so that I could work from home I could review trailers TV spots all of that sort of stuff from home and it worked very well I then after that went back into an office um, to work at Northern Ireland Screen so basically I've had three jobs in my life um, and um, yeah so yeah a subject I'm quite familiar with um, and it's amazing that I'm now working from home again because of entirely different reasons from childcare. Like the rest of us Nicola I can't believe you're 30 years in the business um, you must have some Dorian Gray style picture in the attic <laughs> aging. Um, let's um, go to Louise next. So, um, um, I'm the marketing and communication manager at Screen Ireland. Um, I've been in the film business um, over 20 years now at this stage. I worked in production and distribution before Screen Ireland. And um, I have three children still um, in the throes with three, five and eight. Um, I've worked through having all those kids. Obviously, I took maternity leave, but I do have full-time childcare. And uh, I obviously make it work and um, despite the fact that there's a lot of well there has been travel and it there it has it does have its difficulties however I do feel quite privileged that I've been able to do that and a lot of my colleagues in the industry a lot of my friends um, and a lot of people that I would 
admire and respect. I've seen them leave the industry because they have to kind of choose between livelihoods and parenting. And uh, it's a situation I'd really like to see changed and improved upon. So I think uh, in Screen Island, I've kind of worked across well a, a wide, wide range of areas. But uh, one of the things that I've been really impressed by over the last number of years is how we have really managed to focus on, say, gender parity. And we've done a lot in that area, I think, quite quickly. Still not perfect or nowhere close to it, but there's been a lot of improvements. And this is an area I'd really like to see um, addressed and to see kind of similar improvements happen. Okay, thanks, Louise. And um, we'll move to Ailish now. Hi, Eva. Um, my name is Eilish Bracken. I'm a predominantly a line producer and producer, but I'm also the chair of Raising Films Ireland. Uh, Raising Films Ireland is an organisation uh, that was set up earlier this year uh, in response to uh, the need for this conversation to be had, I guess. Um, and, and I'm really glad that the conversation has been happening throughout 2020 about caring and parenting in the industry. Uh, Raising Films Ireland is a chapter of Raising Films, um, which was started in the UK five years ago um, and was created as a support mechanism to parents and carers in the screen industry. Um, so that is what Raising Films does and, and is planning to do. We're, we're still in our infancy in Ireland, obviously, but we do have great support from our, our parents in, in, uh, in the UK and the chapter in Australia. Um, and really our main aim is to, uh, well, this year our main aim, we, we've gotten funding from Screen Skills Ireland in order to research um, into the industry in Ireland to see what the uh, main requirements of our industry are in terms of support in parenting and caring. So we're really hoping to find out as much as we can from that and to start implementing um, support mechanisms for parents and carers, because we are losing, uh, as we said, we're losing so much amazing, talented people uh, because we can't help facilitate the fact that we, uh, it, it's something that it affects um, absolutely everybody in, uh, in the country and in the world. You will always at some point in your life be a carer, whether you recognize that or not. And even if you choose not to be a parent, you will be a carer at some point. Um, and it's, it's a hugely important issue. And I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Excellent. Thank you, Eilish. And then Jess, please, Jess Drum. Hey, thanks, Aoife. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's it, like everybody has said, it's, it's brilliant that this conversation is happening. Um, I work for Screen Gills Ireland. Um, I've worked for them for the last, since January, so relatively new. Um, um, and I was a, in the camera department before that in drama. Um, and I worked in, you know, in that capacity for 15 years. And then I had kids. And my husband is also in the film industry. So it just didn't really work for me to continue on a full-time capacity. Lots of people do make it work, but it didn't work for me. So I took time out, which I was happy to do as well. But I, I did days here and there, but I would have loved an opportunity, I think, to do like job sharing or, you know, the, the back to work thing. You know, I, I think because I was away for so long, I was almost afraid of going back because things had changed so much. You know, in technology wise and camera, I was afraid to go back and not know what I should know. So um, that was a bit of a bridge. But now um, I'm working for Screen Gills and it's brilliant because it works for my life and, and with the kids and it's flexible enough hours and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm delighted to be doing that. Um, and I'm also part of Raising Films, which I'm delighted to be a part of as well. Um, and it, I'm really happy to be part of that conversation. And I think even in the last year, I've noticed that, you know, these conversations are, they're so important and we're a long way from finding solutions, but the fact that people are recognizing the need and it's not just parents, it's carers, it's not just mothers, it's fathers, you know, it's, it's all of us, it's a grueling industry. Um, and we need to, to start finding ways to retain, I think, the skill base that we have, um, you know, and, and it, we will get there. It's just going to take a little bit of time and a lot of these types of uh, conversations. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Jess. Um, I think maybe to start off, um, it's quite difficult to define caring responsibilities, I suppose, because it does, as everyone pointed to, it. it usually refers to parenthood and people in the industry who have children. Uh, but then again, you, you also have people 
who have to care for people with disabilities, for elderly parents. Um, and I suppose, you know, we have to consider all of those different things. And it's not just, it's very telling that everybody here on the panel is female, you know, and it would have been nice to see uh, a couple of men involved. And I'm glad to see a couple of men in the attendees, which is great because this, you know, it affects everybody. Um, we all have families, we all have caring responsibilities. A lot of us have kids, lot, you know, we all have parents. So um, when you get to a certain age, looking after your elderly parents becomes paramount. Does anybody on the panel have any other examples of caring responsibilities outside of those? Well, I think that there's I also, oh, sorry, sorry. Maybe, maybe we should, why don't you start Rebecca and I'll, I'll go then. I'll be quick. I just want to add in our most recent return to work group, um, we brought in two people recovering from ongoing conditions. So I think especially as parents and carers, it's in everyone's best interest if we pull them into the conversation and we use that blanket definition, because I think uh, we had an individual with MS and uh, one recovering from a brain tumor, as well as the fact that many people are shielding now because of COVID. And so that becomes a caring responsibility too, if you have a vulnerable person in your home. And so I think ironically, COVID could help present, uh, you know, force us into solutions with flexibility if we recognize that the, the care definition is a bit broader. That was actually very similar to what I was going to say is that there's also those who are being cared for and what their needs are in terms of uh, we spoke about this uh, yesterday on another panel we were doing for Screen Skills Net um, about uh, uh, raising films Ireland specifically. But uh, there are a lot of people who are being cared for that are still, uh, they still can be members of the workforce. Um, but they're, they're put out, uh, they're, they're kind of not included because they're seen as somebody who needs to be cared for. Um, and I think that's also a conversation that needs uh, needs to be given light as well that it's not we talk about parenting quite a bit which is an incredibly important part of this and it is quite predominant in the conversation um but there is also the other side of it which is those who are being cared for and what their their needs are in terms of whether uh, in, uh, uh raising films in the uk spend a lot of time working on um moving and and, and working with people in a more kind of who have uh, what's the word uh, Hope used yesterday, um, is they kind of have multi, uh, multiple uh, requirements in terms of their diversity, their disability, and but also they want to be out there, they want to do things, they want to uh, possibly work in the screen industry and there's a, a requirement there to, to help them as well. Um, so that, that's another niche part, I guess, of the caring responsibilities that we can talk about. Yeah. That's very true. And I hadn't actually thought about the point that you both make about COVID. I mean, it, when you think about it, it's so obvious. It crystallizes the argument because everyone has had to try and come to terms with working from home, working with kids who might be off school and caring for elderly people in your family who are really at risk. Um, so hopefully after this all dies down next year and we have vaccines and and all the rest of it there will be more solutions because you know I feel like people are having to come up with solutions this year under COVID so that's a really good point um I'd like to ask the panel about their particular challenges and you know people that they know of with particular challenges in the industry and any particular experiences that they might like to share with us um, for example, Louise, you were talking about the fact that you have three small kids. I think you said three, five and eight, which is very challenging in this industry. I mean, how do you find that? You know, I, I am able to make it work. And, um, you know, I, I personally, well, look, we all, everyone has a, who has small kids faces the balance of life and work and getting the work, work, life work balance right. We you know, there's those weeks when, you know, weeks and months when you haven't seen enough of your kids and then you try and balance that out. But I still feel that within the industry, I think the real challenges are, you know, where, what I've seen from what, from my, I have worked in a, in a quite broad range across the industry and being in Screen Ireland, you do get to see a quite 
you know, different perspectives right across the range from animation through to live action is you, you're working with a lot of individuals in different areas. And what I can say, what I feel like the, the, the real challenges are is, is going back, if you're going back into a scenario whereby there isn't any flexibility, um, if you're going back into a scenario where the only way that you can do your job is is in a is kind of not to kind of not really see your kids at least for five five days of the week, or that your your job is um, you're not able to get childcare that works because there isn't those levels of a flexible childcare that that can help and suit the, the nature of your job, and then one of the other areas that I've seen. Um, is that uh, if you choose to take time out and everyone needs to be able to do that, it's very intimidating to get back in. And I've really seen that with a, personal, a lot of personal friends. And see so what you find out is you find that people are, are choosing to either change their jobs so they don't have that opportunity to go back to their livelihood or that as they do try to get back in, it's incredibly hard. And, um, and I've seen that right through, not just live action production, but right through to animation as well, and uh, across all sectors. And I thought that, um, Rebecca, it's really great to have you here because I, I actually worked with Noreen at Camp years ago, and she was talking to me about this particular scheme. We worked together in Little Bird, and, um, and that was a, a culture, it's a company that they're gone as so I, I can probably speak, but the culture there was no one. No, the, the, I was there in, in my early 20s and the producers that were, were older, they just did not talk about your kids. You didn't, nobody took time off. Everyone was straight back in. Um, and there was just a very strange culture that, that kind of introduced me into, into the film business. But, um, and Noreen was there as well and she definitely experienced that. But she's gone on to set up the return to work scheme in the UK, which really sounds really interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that. Um, sorry, sorry Nick, no, I was just going to share. Um, I think things have got better because when I had my first son um, in London, uh, I was working in the film and TV industry and for a US company. And I remember sitting at uh, a mother and parenting group. Um, I think it was an NCT group. And I had, was sitting with all these, you know, quite powerful executives who work companies like BT and everything. And they were all talking about their six month maternity leave. And I was sitting there going, I get three and I'm taking two and a half, and even that's not, I'm getting six weeks pay. Um, so I was back to work after three months, and that's one of the reasons I initially went to leave the industry, because I realised I couldn't have a second child in that industry in London, because I was taking, I was working in Hammersmith, I was dropping my son at nursery, going to work, picking him up at six o'clock, putting him to bed, getting back online, and talking to America and talking to Brazil and doing all that. Um, and it was it was wearing me down. So I was trying to leave the industry when I came back to Ireland. And it was actually just my ex-boss who was retiring at the time and setting up this consultancy, was a real forward thinker and said, no, we're not losing you from the industry. You can work from home. And I was like, really? How does that work in 1998? But it did. It really did. So, you know, there compromise and flexibility those are the two keys that we have to instill into this industry it can work because there is there is this ridiculous notion in this industry that you have to be physically present um freelance crew really really struggle with this because you know if you say if you say that in a production office i'd like to work from home a couple of days most line producers and production managers would go what no, you have to be here because there will be all these crises and fires to put out and everything. And it's not actually true. And COVID, strangely enough, has showed us this because we've had a lot of productions back up and running. We had Line of Duty back up and running. We've shot two kids TV series, the Studio Lambert TV drama. And I know for a fact that they all started their prep remotely at home because of COVID. And it took COVID to show people that, yes, once you're in the real hard prep, you probably do need to be in the production office, but a bit of flexibility means that you can do some work from home and you can allow people not to have to be there 100% of the time. But I think Louise would agree with this. The slight problem you have as a working mom is you can't work from home with small children unless you have childcare, unless you have some help with childcare because it's full on. I had a full time 
um, nanny the whole time I worked from home. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. it's... Remember during lockdown when carers weren't allowed in our homes, companies yeah. had to take a step back. They had to be adaptable. Deadlines had to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Children running through the background of Zooms had to be acceptable. Yeah. I think particularly as women, but all carers, I think as the world starts to go back to normal, we have to remember what we learned is that we've scooped up a lot of these parents and carers and also people with disabilities that are being cared for, and we've made accommodations for them. And I think as we all rush back to life as it was, we can't just drop all that flexibility and adaptability and demand that everyone turns up at the office and travels for an hour on the train. Yeah. Uh, we have to, and I think if we band together, an example is uh, we're trying in London to refuse to encourage our members to take unpaid work. So I think that season has gone where you expect trainees and interns to work for six months for nothing because that then now it's becoming a middle-class industry where anyone below that can't afford to work in the industry. And I think if we band together and require people to pay the London minimum wage or the minimum working wage, we can band together on this too to encourage flexibility and accommodation for people who need it, I think. I mean, maybe I'm being mm -hmm. too optimistic. I'm very glad to hear you say that because I think that that's a, that is like the kind of fundamental thing that we need to do here. Um, and, and that's where the conversation needs to go. Um, I've had so many conversations about this over the last six months. Um, and we are, we do tend to point to what, what the problems are, but what we need to start focusing on is what the solutions are. And we already have kind of seen a solution in, you know, COVID wasn't good for anybody, but there have been some positive uh, things that have happened during COVID. Like we realized that we can make accommodations like this and that, we've changed our attitude towards working at home um, and working in a different way or working more flexibly. And that's really what the biggest barrier is to having people uh, think about parenting and caring in the screen industry is, is it's the attitude towards it. Um, and I mean, that's not exclusive to the screen industry. That's, that's every industry. That's the entire world. Yeah. yeah. Parenting. That's that's a very good point. I just, this is not something that's just the, the film and TV industry. Yes, we are, we're a very demanding in, industry and we expect long hours, but so many other industries do as well. I mean, you think about nurses and healthcare providers. Who's helping them with their childcare? Who's helping them with a the return to work? Um, you know, this is this is a society. Um, we need a, a massive shift change in how we view people trying to get back into the workplace across all industries. Yeah, and you're right that there ha there have been accommodations made. So, and that's one of the things that that we're the work we're trying to do in raising films is to see where, like, who we need to like. Basically, I think what needs to happen is, or, or what is happening at the moment, is that we are partnering up with different industry stakeholders who are as as you know committed as we are to changing the conversation about this and to changing attitudes within the industry. And you, we need them. We can't do this on our own. We're a facilitator. You know, we're the, the in-between between the issue and the solution. And what we need is, is the partnership of industry stakeholders to um, help us and, and producers. I'm talking to all you producers out there. We need the, the cooperation of producers in order to, uh, you know, uh, and the incentivization to Put some money in the budget to to allow for parenting and caring, to avail of the initiatives once once they once they're put in place, um, to 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 look for the solutions, to be more flexible, to allow a conversation to start where somebody comes to you to say I need to work from home or I need to work for eight hours instead of eleven hours, you know. The, I think that the, one of the biggest problems about parenting and caring in this industry particularly is that people don't even want to start the conversation because they're afraid or they don't even think that they can have. The yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That is exactly it. Because by law, um, Section 75 in Northern Ireland has got nine groups that you're you, uh, under equality law, you are not allowed to discriminate against. And one of those nine groups is, are carers. Um, and you have the right under that law to ask for flexible working hours and to ask for reduction in days. I don't know anyone in, certainly in the world of freelance crew, that would ever walk into a production office and ask for flexibility. I actually heard recently up to my horror of a production secretary who is a single mother and no one in that production office knows that she is a single mother. 
that absolutely horrifies me. There's that level of terror out there that if people find out that they might treat her differently or they might let her go or they may have possibly wouldn't have employed her in the first place. I actually don't think it's as bad as that in our industry. I think the, you know, there is a lot more understanding and a lot of the people are, have been in that position and would offer flexibility, but there's that fear out there. That there's think, a fear to ask. I think the insecurities will always be there because I was putting people up for jobs during lockdown and a lot of hiring managers were saying, we have extra responsibility and challenges with COVID now. So we want everybody to be experienced. They have to have exceptional amount of experience already doing the job. So they weren't willing to take any risks with who they were employing because they were feeling all the added pressure of the extra budget. So mm -hmm. that is going to be inevitable. People are going to feel comfortable with how they've been doing things up till now. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to suggest that they take what they consider to be small risks, we've got to be creative about it. I think one example is yesterday, I just got three people hired. They're all returners Two have a medical challenge. One doesn't, but they're coming back from caring. They're all going in and doing a post-production supervisor role together. So they're joint, uh, we handled the training for a month because they were producers and then they learned how to do supervision and they're going to do it in tandem on a film, a high-end television documentary. And I think that's the real win. Somebody was willing to, we were sponsoring them in their training and someone was willing to take them on in January for them to share the responsibility so that if one person has a bad day, for example, and I think every success that we demonstrate along this lines will show hiring managers that they can be a bit more open-minded. Yeah, it's a good point. I think it's all about a mental shift, isn't it? It's, it's making people aware that things can change and we can work in a different way. And that is interesting about COVID being, you know, having a silver lining and that people realize they can work remotely, they can work from home. But I'm interested to hear from Jess about the crew experience, because obviously there are a lot of people who can't work from home. Um, and I, I produced a 10-part TV drama during lockdown. Uh, and the few people that could work from home did, but the vast majority of crew obviously couldn't. And Jess, what's your experience of people that you know in the gills? How yeah. do they feel about it? I mean, it, it's an interesting one because I think you know, from my perspective, the crew that I worked with when I was having kids were brilliant and they were so supportive. And, you know, when I was pregnant, there'd be another trainee there to help carrying stuff. And they were amazing. And, and obviously, because they were protecting me, the producers and the production were fine with it and everything was great. But on a practical level, it was difficult because, you know, I think it depends on what level you're at. If you have kids and you're at, say, lower than mid-range level in the, in your training you can't afford to have childcare at the level that you need to have it because it's short call you know call times change or actually you're it's you know we're in a mountain and there's no reception and what if something happens to one of your kids it's all of those things so um i think that's one of the the, the points that became an obstacle but i do think that you know in fairness it wasn't that the obstacle was there in, in terms of the employers it was a practical thing. And I do think that the, you know, the landscape is, is quite positive in, in the, you know, I've, I've come across many women and carers and parents, you know, generally who make it work because there's other people around them. And, you know, I think that, you know, job sharing on a practical sense on a set may work. And I'm, I'd be really interested to, to do that, to look down that avenue, because I think there's no reason that it couldn't, it, it hasn't been done here really, but it could be. And I think that would be amazing because you can put your heart and soul into three days, knowing that you at least have the other two days with your, you know, care with your child or whoever, you know, so it, it is challenging. And I think, you know, society is changing. Um, and I've, I do think that a lot of people do see the support, but there are still people, I think it's the getting back in there is the challenge. So you take a little bit of time off and you do lose your momentum, I think. And people believe in you, but they forget after a while. If you keep saying, no, uh, I can't now, I can't now, you, you get down to the bottom of the list through no fault of anybody's. And I think, you know, a, a scheme like um, Rebecca was talking about would be a brilliant thing here because, you know, it gives you that, I suppose, support to go back, you know. 
Um, and I do think that a lot of the challenges are the long hours. And we all know, you know, you can be working a, a really long day and come home to a sick baby. They're not going to want to go to the carer. They want you. And then you're going back into work. And I think for me, I felt like I was doing neither of my roles well. I wasn't a brilliant parent or brilliant at my job. I was just kind of skimming through both. And I wanted to be as be as good as I could at both. So um, that's why I made the choice that I made. You know, you're going into work, the, the hours are so long. Um, and if you've been up all night with a sick child or for any reasons, it's very difficult then to be as good as you can be, you know. Yeah. Really that is such a common experience, isn't it? That guilt, I felt guilty for the last 10 years, to be honest, not doing my job as a parent well enough, not doing doing my job as a producer well enough. And, you, you know, never the twain shall meet. Yeah. And that guilt is just constant and it shouldn't be. I, when I was pregnant for the second time, Oprah Winfrey said, um, and I remember I've never forgotten what she said. She said, a woman can have it all. She can have a marriage, she can have a career and she can have kids, but she can only ever do two of them well. <laughs> and I remember at the time I thought mm, I think she might be right uh, I'm going to try and prove her wrong but yeah but don't forget the industry is changing and I think I hate to yeah. widen the conversation but with what happened with Weinstein and with diversity and now with COVID we forced a lot of change in a very short period of time and I think what this year demonstrated is which TV and film roles can be done from home and which ones can't and an interesting thing is, so someone on our program who was on set, but then developed this illness, it was very easy for him to see which roles he could pick now, because a lot of careers carried on at home. And he's now gone into more of a paperwork supporting role because it's more comfortable for him. So I think that mm -hmm. was good. And then the other thing is, you know, I've been telling people I can't do that phone call at three o'clock because that's the school run. Now, a year ago, I'd be humiliated to say that to somebody about doing a conference call. But right now, the whole world was leveled. And we were like, yeah. we all yeah. have to be understanding. So I think we can embrace some of these changes. I just feel really optimistic that we're moving forward. I, 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 think, it's been, yeah, I think it's been a massive change in the last 10 years. I've gone from seeing a production that didn't invite two women back for the second season because they were pregnant um, to seeing a huge production that was set up in Belfast. Um, positively going out and finding two women to job share um, who had small children because they really, you know, just wanted to, to make a difference. And the job sharing worked incredibly well. I think we need a lot more job shares. Yes, I agree. I agree with that, Nicola. You know, yeah. it, it's definitely about changing attitudes and yeah. uh, looking at practical solutions and, um, you know, being able to you get a huge benefit, I think. There can be a bit, like, there can be problems as well. And I know, especially on small, low, lower rigid films, where budgets are incredibly tight and every penny counts and you want to get every penny on screen. So there's a lot of practical issues. But I just think if there's a collective will to make this work and to be an inclusive industry. And I think, um, you know, that Screen Ireland is, uh, our, we'll be launching our next kind of three-year strategy in the coming months and you know inclusivity and diversity are really genuinely um at the heart of that strategy mm -hmm. we're trying to become an organization we're not there yet we're trying to become an organization whereby you know it is within the dna of the organization across every department and trying to look at every way that we can be a more inclusive industry so I, I, you know, hope there will be a collective will, but we are doing a survey as well, just to say, and um, that'll be coming out quite shortly. So we want feedback from the industry and um, into that. So we want to hear, you know, the issues that people are, what's important, what needs to be addressed, you know, and so it's important that people's voices are heard because I think that is the key thing that's changing before people, again, they didn't mention that didn't mention their kids they didn't I remember that was advice my mother gave me when I went back to work she said just don't talk about the kids you know you're, you're there to work no one wants to know what's going on at home and, you know she, she's an amazing woman she you know she's she's done a lot but that was her her advice and that's not really right and yeah. we want things to change I think there's a will to change um, but we need to be heard we need to make our voices heard and those challenges need to be to be looked at and, and we're not saying they're all going to be solved overnight they're not you know but at least if, 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 if there can be small changes and then we can look at what the bigger goals are but um I, I also feel that 
unless we do, unless we are heard collectively and are empowered to be heard, that um, that we won't be able to make those changes. Yeah, it's a good point. It's about collective will and, and people power, I think. And we seem to have naturally moved into the subject of solutions. And I'd like to focus on solutions for a while. People have mentioned job sharing, for example, um, shorter working day. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, just throw that out to the panel generally. What do you think are the best solutions for our industry, which encompasses so many different types of workers? I mean, we do focus on shooting crew quite a lot, but, you know, we have to think about writers and how they work and producers and how they work and, you know, uh, administrators and people in state funding bodies. And, you know, there's so many different types of workers in the industry and so many different types of solutions. Um, but at the moment, we don't have an industry that is family friendly. So, you know, what do people think about what the best solutions might be? Um, I'd love to know, and this isn't to put you on the spot, Eva, at, at all, but what I'd love to ask the question of you and uh, Screen Producers Ireland and producers about, because the biggest, the toughest thing that I think, the, uh, the toughest area of this industry to try and tap into and to try and help is the onset crew. Because there's a lot of arguments for, you know, job sharing doesn't work because you it's a creative role and it means you have two creative, you know, beings together and they not, might knock heads. And, you know, I, and I've had this, I'm the administrator for uh, Production Guild as well. And we've had this conversation and about how, how it might work in, in the more, the more creative roles and the less office based roles. Um, and the, the, que the question that comes back to me is, well, why don't we do shorter working days like they do in France or like they do in, in Scandinavia? And that's a that's an interesting conversation to have with producers here as to whether shorter working days is the, the future and is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's not something that happens. Um, it, it happens in European countries. America has way longer shooting days than we do. But is that a conversation that's happening at all in? in Absolutely, it is. And it's a really interesting question, Eilish, because it's something that's come up over and over again. And it's something that I would love if we could achieve work-life balance for crew, um, myself and Jess were on the negotiating committee for um, the new shooting crew agreement, which was signed off on Monday, which Very is a real good joy, which yeah. is brilliant. Very and nice to present. Yeah, well done, everyone on that, by the way. Yeah, no, it's great because uh, it does have a provision for, for work-life balance. Um, that's not defined in the agreement, but there's a monitoring committee that's going to be set up to talk about that. Um, and to try and figure out what people want. Because it's challenging. I'll be honest with you, I had a project a couple of years ago where I tried to introduce an eight hour day and the crew didn't want it. And you know, the line producer went around to everybody and asked them if they'd be willing to do this. And obviously there'd be a small reduction in pay because it'd be an eight hour day as opposed to a 10 hour day. And people shot it down, you know, they didn't want to do it. Um, so there has to be understanding on both sides. I think the crew need to know that if they, you know, if they're going to have work-life balance and a shorter working day, um, it doesn't really make sense um, to expect the same money for that. You know, you kind of have to. And, and that's a huge job. agreement. An eight-hour day costs the same as a ten-hour day, which is kind of nonsensical. And I don't see any production companies going for that, to be honest, because no. we become very non-competitive and. You know, it'd be very difficult to get co-productions up and running here with that in place. Um, but it's definitely a conversation that's happening all the time um, in the industry. And it's something that we really want. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a tough thing. Yeah. Um, sorry. Go, go ahead, Rebecca. I don't think that we should be so quick to walk away from the job share possibility, even on set with crew, because one of the ramifications of COVID that I discovered is a lot of production managers had to line up two people for each role. So I watch this on really high budget television shows. And the reason why they did this is so many people were testing positive. They had to have a quick step in. And if they're willing to do that and say that under these circumstances, these two camera persons, these two first EDs are equivalent to each other. They've gone that far to say they don't need that continuity under duress. So then it's possible for us to then stand up and go, well, could they stagger their hours? Could they stagger their days? And you could have two first ADs or two cameramen who are sharing, who are aligned. I just think it's a possibility for the people who need it. Obviously not the whole crew for people who want the overtime, 
but maybe going forward, it's something to look at. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the job sharing, shorter working days, Scandinavian style working day. I mean, they, they have it made, you know, they do have eight hour days and that's what everyone expects. And it's just the way they work. And it's just so much better for, for families. Um, and I know the French are pretty good in that they try and um, have a definite ending to your working day so that you don't have to, you know, get involved with texts, emails. I think they actually passed a law on it back in 2016. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, yeah. Which for users would be amazing, but it would never work um, because you I know mean, you're in different countries. I think that 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 is that's the that is the fundamental thing though is is when you hear about something like that and you go, oh God, it would never work here. Because it yeah. could, it could, mm. it needs to require, it needs the attitude thing, so it needs the the cooperation of people in order to make it work. Yeah. Um, and I, I, every time, because we we did a call out for testimonials at, on raising films earlier on in the year when we were launching properly, and um, I mean the amount the, the amount of testimonials that came flooding in from people that just wanted to tell their story and wanted to be heard. And a lot of the time when we ask people what it is that they want, and, and we are going to be continuing to asking people what they want uh, during the research project, um, uh, and we're, we're going to be reaching out to our community and all of our kind of larger community to, to help with that. And we're doing a survey as well, Louise, we should talk to see if we can do, get some uh, uh, comparative data going. Um, is the two big issues are time and money. It's, uh, and, and obviously they're big issues for lots of, of, of areas, but those are the areas that people want help with is, is the, so it is the flexible working, it is, um, but it's also the money. And I, I look at the, the, the model that Screen Skills Ireland and Screen Ireland have created um, themselves, which is the training model, where they, ha they now require certain budget, budgets over a certain amount to have a certain percentage uh, that goes to training. And that, that has been, uh, Asked, uh, asked by Section 481 so that we are cultivating new, uh, a proper crew. And that's a big issue in this country is that we don't have enough crew for the amount of, of jobs that are coming in. Um, and I, I can't see why we couldn't have something like that for, uh, for parenting and caring in that area of the industry is to have a, a, a small percentage of your budget that goes, goes towards the parenting and caring responsibilities that your crew have. And, and I think that that is a practical way to look at how you deal with, with on-set crew, because that is, I, I find that that is the biggest issue to, to, um, to, to look at uh, in, in terms of helping them to have their, to, to, to continue working in their job and also be able to uh, meet their caring responsibilities. I think there's a real appetite for that, um, Eilish, within the crew. You know, my experience definitely was that, you know, as Louise was saying, you know, don't talk about your kids. It was quite the opposite for me where all of my, my crew would be like, oh, there's this job and it's short hours. Maybe you'd be into it, you know, or mm -hmm. I also, when things were really busy, did a kind of a job share unofficially where I was I'm not allowed, but they suggested I bring the kids to school and then come in and somebody covered me for that time. So, you know, unofficially it does work and people are really eager. It just, you know, I think that, they came down to it that it was difficult for me to afford the childcare. But now that when my kids started school, then it worked. So it's early on and maybe there's something around, you know, I don't know if, if there's some sort of tax relief that could be implemented for parents or carers for a certain period of time, because it's not forever. It's only for a little while when they're kind of under 10 and um, where you really it's just so much money that you're paying towards childcare because of the sporadic hours. Um, but I definitely feel like the, the, the appetite is there. And I thought that was a really positive thing. People would ring and go, listen, how are the kids? Because we have this thing, any chance, you know, you might be around because it's at the weekend and maybe someone can mind them. So like people did keep that in their heads, which I thought was a really positive thing. It was very encouraging. Absolutely. But it's, it's also because just they, they need you like they need you you are uh, you are a member of you're a member of the talent pool in this this uh yeah. this industry and you were needed on set like you're you know uh, and and that's the thing is splitting what when where you're needed and how sure. uh, how you do that because they value the, the what you bring to a set and and it happens with every parent and carer that drops off the industry because yeah. of this they're valued on set for their skills 
but it's it's that they can't make it work on the other side and it's yeah it's the very, practical yeah, level yeah, exactly practical can i suggest that we can encourage the change quicker if all these things we've been talking about that people moms and dads have been doing under the radar quietly sneaking out of the office getting cover pretending you can't do something at three o'clock because I don't know why. I think if we slowly start to make this commonplace in the culture where we continue to talk about it after COVID, like I can't do that because of this, can I leave early? It'll mean the next generation of young women that are getting into production will see us and they won't be shy to say, can I have this person step in for me at three? You know, because we'll have demonstrated for them that we weren't sacked we came back for the next season. We were hired again. So You're I think- Absolutely it, right. You're I saw my right. supervisor yeah. hiding the fact she left the office at four o'clock every day. So I, you know, intuitively I went, I've got to hide it and I can't talk about my kids. It's so yeah. true. It shouldn't be a dirty little secret. It's, you know, the most natural thing in the world to have a family. On and that I, job though, I, I used to sneak in apologetically at quarter past nine, you know, at the start. And by the end, I was just like, yeah. That you know, yeah. it's not like I'm not making up for it when I'm here. You know, it's not like I'm off on my phone or showing people pictures of my kids all the time, or you know, I'm doing my job when I'm here. So, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's about being present and not making excuses for the fact that you have a life outside of your job. Yeah, it goes for everyone, not just and, care. And I think I think that is beginning to change. Yeah. I am definitely seeing more and more I people being change. more open. Yeah, um, it has changed tremendously since the, you know, the dark days of when I worked in London, where that's exactly what I did. I would I would have emails lined up for when I went home so they knew I was back online again in case anyone thought I wasn't pulling my weight. And it is a society thing, especially the London culture was very much, you know, if you don't turn up for work on Saturday, don't bother turning up on Monday. And, you know, I the, the French thing is really interesting, Aoife, because that is a society um thing in France um, it always used to amaze us and the US distributors that I worked for because France always had a legal working week which I'm pretty sure was either 35 or 37 hours a week that was you know the UIP office in Paris if you didn't phone them before five o'clock you didn't get them they were home and we used to go I can't believe that that's ridiculous they leave the office at five o'clock it was law it was the law and there was a limit on the amount of, of overtime that they did. So the French have always had that great work life. You know, family is important and work life balance is important. So the crew probably were more open to it. Yeah. You also know to call them before five, you know, so it does work once exactly. you set those boundaries. Yeah. yeah. The joke with the French is they work to live, they don't live to work, right? That's it. Exactly. That's the way it should be. I think yeah. the joke's on us, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm from America and I so I used to work for an international company that um, the Americans balked at the amounts of maternity leave we got and sick leave and holiday pay. They're ages behind us as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I've had so many colleagues try to move to the UK because they're much more acceptable here. So and we still have, you know, miles to go on it. So I oh, think yes. yeah. the more we can demonstrate change is positive. Sure. Yeah, and I think there's enormous benefits for the industry as well. There's a wider, you know, we, if we want to grow the sector, which we do, and, um, you know, 2021 is going to be really, hopefully, really, really busy. Um, but, it's, but, you know, it's looking like it will be really busy. And I think, Alice, you'd agree with that. Absolutely. So, like, we want to have a wide um, talent pool. We want a wide diversity of people in the industry. And um, we need to just be, you know, allowing for how we can um, be accommodating to, so that we hear different voices and so that there is um, a diverse, um, you know, variety of people working in the sector and that that talent pool doesn't um, start to fall off. And I just think that anyone who's been a carer, you know, no matter who they're looking after, they learn, you know, they become incredibly efficient, incredibly productive. And, uh, you know, you, there's, there's enormous benefit for the industry and you get a huge commitment. I think anytime you show flexibility, um, and I would say that even in Screen Ireland, you know, you get enormous commitment from showing flexibility. And I think there's a lot to be benefited from. And I do yeah. think that that is going to be something that we will face in 2021 is that we are going to have to think creatively about how, where and how we get crew. Because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, 
um, as a line producer, like from the, the, you know, having my ear to the ground and knowing what's happening next year, everyone wants to shoot in April, you know, like there's going to be lots and yes. lots and lots of projects happening next year because there's <laughs> so many people who've been waiting until the vaccine in order to, to start shooting. Um, and we're not going to have enough crew. That, it's as simple as that. Like we don't have enough crew for all of these projects. So we have to start thinking more creatively about where we get the crew. And we are obviously, um, we're making huge strides in training, which is is incredibly encouraging. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. And, and that speaks to the fact that the intern culture has left Ireland as well, because that was a huge thing. Um, I thankfully never had to do it. And, and I thank my very first job in Ireland for that. Um, shout out to Blinder Films. Um, but the, uh, the culture is changing in that way and there's no reason why we can't think more creatively about where we're going to find our crew for all of these amazing projects we're going to be churning out next year. And I think with Screen Skills Support and some other um, uh, companies and also the Mayor of London, we're trying to get a few steps ahead of that because we see that coming. Um, like we're trying to visit job centers and train people in the basics of entry-level positions to get into the industry and also uh, retraining people who are in the events industry or theater industry that have fallen out because they haven't got work at the minute. So the people are there. It's just, we need institutions and companies that are gonna set aside the budget to train people, get their CVs ready, get the basic skills ready, coronavirus training, because the productions are coming back. So a lot of our crew are now Uber driving or Amazon driving because the, job, the works haven't been there. We're going to have to get them back. And how do we do this? I think we can't put the responsibility on the individuals and the carers to necessarily take that risk and come back. I think we need to be present and you know loud about drawing them back and what we have to offer them to get them retrained and, and into the industry. Absolutely. And, and I know that there is there's a, you know, a, a percentage of crew that are sitting at home, but have been sitting at home minding uh, kids and having caring responsibilities for the last however yeah. many years, that this may be a really brilliant opportunity for them to re-enter the workforce. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, why not try to, to seek that out? How do we do now? Now that's my my my. Uh, my mission for 2021 is to try and find those people and, and get them back into the workforce because that is, you know, we're going to need them. And, and I don't think you have an issue, Ailish, because I think there's quite a lot of people out there who have had enough of their kids during 2020. <laughs> and into the workplace. <laughs> um, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of people uh, volunteering <laughs> to get back to work. Uh, we have a question from one of our attendees. I'll just read it out. Uh, one thing that other countries are looking at is parental leave, which is mandatory for both parents. This means that women could not be disadvantaged by taking time off as men would be doing the same and it would help level the playing field and probably better for the kids as well. What does anyone think about that? I mean, I yeah. yeah, well, I think it's 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 certainly something that if you're in um, on a permanent contract, um, should absolutely be the case. It's more difficult, I think, for crew, because who who covers that? Because you're all incredibly short-term contracts. Um, but yeah, absolutely, because you, you you know, with the best will in the world, the childcare conversations tend to revolve around women, not men. Um, and I'm sure a lot of men would really appreciate the opportunity to um, step away for a while and look after their kids. It's not that they don't want to. Most of them, it's not that they don't want to. Absolutely. I, I actually think that it's quite an unforgiving industry for men with children that need yeah. to leave work. Really, and I think really, really there's passionate. no men on this panel, I know, but like, you know, if 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 myself, my husband were both at work and something happened and he had to leave, it would be, oh, as opposed to me going, yeah. well, you mm. know, she has kids, that's part of the package. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that that's quite, and that would be something that if, if we could change roles, I'd say he would be absolutely delighted for a short yeah. period of time, maybe. That's, uh, that's, right right across, that's right across society there yeah. as well. It's a society thing for sure, yeah. We yeah. do need to have more men involved in these conversations. Yeah. It's also men caring for ill wives or ill parents. They're, yeah. they're discouraged from taking time off in that respect too, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're just not seen as carers as much as, as women and that does need to change. Yeah. And it's, it's not that they're not thing. carers either. Yeah. I mean, 
Raising Films did a, a they've done uh, Raising Films in the UK have done two research um, projects, one about parenting, but one about caring that came out recently called We Need to Talk About Caring, which is a very, very good research project to have a read of uh, if, if anybody wants to have a look at it. And men are hugely affected by that sector. Not like, and, and you know, parenting really is, it is a conversation that does tend to focus on women, but men are kind of the, the silent partners in this, in the caring conversation. Yeah. As well, because they, they're affected by that um, uh, almost more um, based on the research that was done than, than the women are. Um, I, I do think it's important to get the research in place. I know Screen um, Ireland through Screen Skills have, have given um, funding for research for raising films, and it'll be really important to bring the problems and potential solutions and discuss them as an industry, and that there's buy-in kind of from the ground up, and also obviously direction. But I, I you know, our board is very supportive. You know, Annie Duna, Marion Quinn, you know, Katie, Kate. There's, there's four women on the board at the moment. The board will change. Marion will still be there, um, but the board will change in March. Um, but, you know, there's a will there to be as supportive as possible, but solutions have to come from the industry and we kind of, they, they need to be discussed and they need to feel right for our industry. See, we can look internationally as well, but we've got to have, you know, the culture can be very different in France. What will work for us? And, um, and I do think that there's a process that needs to be gone through um, over the next 12 to 18 months. But when that research comes through from Raising Films, I think that there'll be an, it'll be an important time to have another conversation to push this forward. And let's get that research out there and get it all across the top periodical screen and broadcast and Hollywood Reporter. I mean, we heard the research that during lockdown, more women stepped out of work than men, right? So I write across, that's right across every industry. Yeah. So now what happens in January, February, March, when the industry tries to crank back up and get its workforce, what's going to happen to all these women that step down for eight or nine months to cover the lockdown and coronavirus? We need them back. Mm -hmm. So I would like to be reading about that right now. Like, how do we find them and how do we encourage them to come back, even though they took a back seat to their partners? And Nicola, I wanted to ask you about uh, that film that was made with the help of NIS recently, A Bump Along the Way. There was a childcare grant involved in that, wasn't there? There was. Um, so we run a, a new talent feature scheme every year. We produce one very, very ultra low budget. The total budget is 350,000. We're talking massively low, but it's to give a first time director, writer and producer their first um, proper credit. So we fund it, we fully fund it along with a post-production house, Yellow Moon and the UK tax credit, which the producers have to find someone to cash flow. So it's very, very tight. We are wrapping on Saturday on this year's, which is called Mandrake. So a bump along, along the way was um, produced by Louise Gallagher and directed by Shelley Love and written by Tess McGowan, so all female team. Um, and it became very clear to us, Shelley is a single mom, um, living in Bangor and hugely talented, um, but she was facing severe childcare issues. She, you know, she had her parents, but they were quite elderly. And she was gonna step away from the project because with it being so low budget, you know, she was earning a tiny bit of money for doing it, as were all the crew. It is talent development. There's a lot of stepping up, etc. So we did step in in that case um, because we thought we can't lose this talent from the industry. And um, she got a grant as well. Uh, might have been the UK film and TV charity, but we paid the majority of her childcare for prep and for shooting and for post um, to allow her to do it. Now, we... It was brilliant and the film, as you all, I hope you all seen it, it I mean, it, it did fantastically well and Shelley is attached to lots more projects, etc. And our hope now is that she will be on a project where she can afford childcare. But when you knew what Shelley was earning on that film, there was no way, you know, she would have to make the choice between doing the film or looking after her children. And we took that choice, you know, away from her and we paid for the childcare. Um, I must admit, we, we did then get asked on a few occasions by other female directors who would pay for their childcare, but we pointed out that they were earning probably 
10 to 20 times more than Shelley was earning on um, Bump Along the Way. So unfortunately, we couldn't do that on a regular basis. But we would certainly step in on occasions like that there where there is a compelling argument for paying for childcare. So it was sort of a once off. Was there a discussion afterwards then about maybe making it a more permanent fixture? A case by case basis, definitely similar circumstances. It's hard for us to justify because we're obviously public, publicly funded. That one, we almost fully fund the production along with other public funding, which is the UK tax credit. And then on top of that, we're paying for childcare. And if someone is earning a substantial amount on the film, it's very hard for us to say, well, we have to do this because we're special. You know, if you want to um, fund uh, a healthcare provider or a teacher's childcare, you know, you're on your own, but we're a very special industry, so we're allowed to do that. So we do have to make sure it's 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 very much justified. And we felt in that case it was very justified. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a hornet's nest, really, because then people could ask, why couldn't we extend this to, to fathers? Um, yeah. And Oh and do you know what we would? No, yeah. I think we would. It, it, yeah. Case by case basis, yeah. The argument was there and we were perfectly confident to, to argue that without this assistance, Shelley would have to step away from the project. Yeah. And has anyone on the panel heard of the idea of having childcare on the set? Yes. Um, which can, I mean, it has worked in certain instances um, in the UK and they now have the Wonderworks crash, um, at, I think it's at Elstree, uh, which is a, a repurposed bus, um, which we are, we're, we're, quite, we're looking into, but there are very different um, uh, requirements for crashes in Ireland that there are, than there are in the UK. So it, it may or may not be a uh, possibility for us, but there are quite a few um, new studios um, starting, uh, which, uh, you know, points to Ireland becoming in, in some part or in, in, you know, a larger part of service industry, as well as having an indigenous, indigenous industry that is, is, yeah. uh, is, is very healthy, obviously. Um, but I don't see any reason, and I have been speaking um, in informal terms only now to some of the people involved in those studios about the possibility of creating creches there. There used to be a crash many moons ago in Ardmore, um, and I don't, I, I don't see a reason why uh, something like that could not become a possibility in some of the larger studios in Ireland. There's a new uh, film and television studio being built in centre of London at the minute, and they are building a crash into it. So I think it's another sign that as we go forward, that's an expectation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the on-location ones are the, the, the tougher ones to kind of think about. Um, oh. And whether, I mean, one of the, the main reason why I started raising films is because I've been having conversations with my friends for the last five years, because we're, we're all at an age now where we're having children. Um, about how the bloody hell we're going to do it, you know, because we we couldn't see there being any support from the industry. We all really valued our jobs and, and really wanted to continue our, you know, our creative uh, jobs and our livelihood alongside the, you know, wanting to have children. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, I think that if you, if you thought about, again, if you thought about it creatively, if there was a, a kind of a more on location shoot if there are several people within in that shoot, and that, that's again starting that conversation and making it a conversation that people can have, um, that you know required childcare, can we pool together and talk about getting somebody to help with the childcare? I I heard about a a, a very low budget project, a Screen Ireland project recently, that had a costume designer who's an absolutely wonderful um, designer and had, had just very recently had a baby and they helped and enabled to ha allow her to have the baby on set, albeit without childcare. So although she was able to have the baby with her and everybody was very helpful, it would have been an easier situation for her if uh, there was a, a fund there to help her with childcare in the same way as Northern yeah. Ireland Green helped Shelley. So, those are the kinds of stories that we're mining. Those are the kinds of stories that we're looking at um, in order to try and come up with those practical solutions. Because I think Ireland is a very different industry to the UK in the fact that we are a physically smaller country. So it, there are these solutions, these practical solutions that we can kind of come up with that may be a little bit harder to do in the UK. Um, like, you know, crashes on set or, you know, uh, 
uh, pooling a fund together for a, you know, to hire somebody to look after one or two or three children who are, it, that it's required from the people live in the, the, the project or homework clubs um, dotted across Dublin because there are most of our industry at the moment is in Dublin. So there's, there are these practical solutions that could work for some, but won't work for all. Yeah, but I think where's the, where there's demand for it, it will be provided. If you think about top level talent or executives, if they demanded childcare travel with them, it's accommodated. So I think if we're moving into 2021 and we have a desperate need for crew and, and that would enable people to work, then that might be the solution. That might force the solution. Yeah, it's definitely something that we should lobby the government about because I've noticed over the years in the industry that the governments tend to have their bugbears that they concentrate on, for example, regional um, regional funding. That became a big thing a few years ago and decentralization. And now there's a regional tax credit. Um, so And very often things come down to, to money, uh, unfortunately, um, and the lack of. So the regional tax credit has meant that a lot of productions have moved to the regions outside of Dublin and Wicklow, and that's a real result. Um, obviously, COVID is a case in point, uh, you know, a more immediate one, but funding was provided for that immediately because it had to be, and it was a crisis situation. Um, and there are other examples, you know, tr training has become a huge keyword for the government, and they've thrown money at training um, through Screen Skills Ireland. And I think if, if we could manage to get this subject um, to be a proper talking point with the government, you know, there's a chance that we might get uh, some regional, not but tax credit just for caring responsibilities in itself. I think that could work a form of a tax credit for parents uh, and for production companies with parents working for them. Uh, if there were creches, after schools, home work clubs on set, uh, you know, you could perhaps avail of tax relief for some form of funding for that as well. So I think really making it a talking point is very important with the government. I agree with that in terms of making it a talking point, but you know, the, this, the, the, that research I think will be really important. And then like I was saying before, it is a, about the industry together with the stakeholders looking at what solutions may work, what's the best way for funding to be spent and, uh, and going through that process um, and I, I know it's early days, but I think that hopefully we'll see change happen. But um, but there, that's a discussion to be had, I think, between the stakeholders and and the industry. You know? I I would agree, with that Louise. That happens, I you know yeah, I think the research will be essential because you'll you're going to need a very compelling case that we have to be treated differently by the government because the compelling case is that all industry needs this sort of help to get women back to the workplace. Um, so we, we would need some pretty hefty research to say that we have a crisis at the minute and we need some assistance with it, even if it's just in the short term. Yeah. I think Aoife's right, though, that it does come down to money at the end of the day. And it depends on a crew perspective where you are in your training. If you're a trainee and you have a baby, you can't work. You just can't, no matter what tax credits you get, because it will not cover your childcare costs. So, you know, but if you're a HOD that's that's a different situation so I think that would be an argument that would could be placed as you know you're not going to retain people if there isn't even at least assistance for short term until you can maybe go like I had a conversation about job sharing and basically it was very interesting but but they said like it's a maintenance thing that they do while their children are at a certain age and when their children then you know are older and they want to progress then they won't job share anymore so it is about progressing through it and you know if you want to have children you have to wait till you get to a certain level of seniority in the industry which doesn't make practical sense either you know so um, and that even, shouldn't be the case in any industry no know, exactly so you're waiting, I mean, you know. yeah so i think as well on a practical level on set crashes is great but also there's such a high demand to have a name down for a crash or after school that if you're working for six weeks on a job and you take them out to put them on a, a you yeah. know so there's all of those things and I think that it really does come down to money where there's a, a tax credit or a relief for a person for a certain amount of time within their caring role you know not all the time but just to get them over the the tough spot you know till school starts maybe I think yeah. what worked for us I, I think money definitely does talk and I think 
For the third year, we've had 10 returners that were very anxious about getting back into the industries that they left. Uh, they were old carers. And I think uh, between government money and stakeholder money and some, you know, screen skills for one gave money, it put us in a position where we could go to the top employers and say, risk-free, we're paying their salary for two weeks. Take this person on so that they've got something on their CV. Yeah. And almost all 30 of them, three years in a row, hit the ground running once we got that one company to take them on for two weeks. That's, that's all it took. And so... I'm looking at that as so many carers are coming back after almost a year off, whether the money can be put up by stakeholders that want to support the industry to go to ner uh, you know, nervous hiring managers and just go, we're taking the risk away from you. Give them the opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, pay Bridge their the gap. And the package also provides for yeah. training and childcare. So it's all given to the applicant up front once they're accepted into the program. So you know, you're nervous about going back. I don't remember how to do a CV or the industry's changed or I need COVID training. I can't afford COVID training. So to give that applicant that money and also provide money to the employer, it just gets things going immediately. So unfortunately, money does make change happen, I think. Yeah, it sounds like a really good scheme, Rebecca, and one that we could avail of here, definitely. Um, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of our time. In fact, I think we're at the end of our time. But I wanted to ask the panel, are there any things they'd like to add or any small changes um, that you think we can start with immediately? Um, one thing I would like to add is, is uh, just to, to tell our attendees that um, Raising Films will be will require um, our community to come uh, to, to fill out surveys and to be part of our research. Um, and in order to find out about that, uh, if you uh, want to become a member of our mailing list, we will let you know when that happens. So if you go to our, our uh, website, uh, raisingfilmsireland.com slash subscribe and subscribe to our mailing list, uh, we need your voices. We need your input in order to make this an industry-wide useful piece of research. Um, so if you can be part of it, we'd really appreciate it. I'd really echo that. I really would. You know, unless the voices are heard and the need is shown and, and the, the research is done, we can't progress. And it has to be that kind of, there has to be a process around it, but the voice needs to be heard. And we would say that, please feed that feedback into the Screen Orleans. Um, we'll be doing a stakeholder um, consultation and there will be a survey with regard to our next um, our, our next uh, strategy which is the next three years so this is what we need to make if the industry wants to make change happen this is the the process to to, to, to try and make that happen yeah and um, i just wanted to say um thank you to screen producers ireland because it's conversations like this and and all the different people here with different backgrounds that make the change happen and it, it will be slow but it, there is an appetite and everybody wants it to happen um and it will you know if if this platform is is used um and hopefully there'll be many more panels and conversations like this excellent Thank you so much, everyone. Um, that was really interesting. It was fascinating. A lot to think about. Um, and thank you all for, for taking part. Uh, and happy Christmas. Happy, happy Christmas. Christmas. Thanks. Take care. Happy Thanks, Christmas, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.